Welcome. This is the January 18th Beehive Production User Call. We have Andrew, Hans, Chuck, Rod, Patrick, Jan, and myself. Uh, a public service announcement. Please test Doug R's 9P client code. Apparently, it will do root on VF. Uh, root on 9P for free BSD. That is one of those sort of holy grail things to aim for. Uh, Vitali has been shouting from the clock tower about save restore formats and updates. And I know Chuck, this is of some interest to you. I only learned a few minutes ago that one of his two reviews is accepted. It would be this one and the other MTRR should be save restore. So he added that in. Okay. Then taking a step closer back, this hasn't been tickled since December, but uh, it is above my pay grade to say what the snapshot buffer size and FBuff size means, but hopefully that's getting some attention. Chuck, I know you had some interest uh, within the last few weeks on Save or Store. Where, what are your motivations? How can you help? How do you assess the situation? Um, my motivations are impure and devious, um, but that's not important right now. Uh, yeah, I I am interested in Save or Store. There's the big caveat in the man page that says the format isn't stable. I would like to see that stable, and so whatever I can do to help. Um, so if, if those changes got uh, approved, I will add that to my list of stuff to go test. Can you describe what those first changes mean to the rest of us? Uh, I would love to, but I have not looked. Okay. Um, I have reached out repeatedly to the key parties and not heard a single thing. So maybe those conversations are taking place, but they're not in the open. So hopefully things will move forward. Yep. This is one of the things that, that I would really like to see move, but um, I, I, I had a couple of other things pop up. Um, that that Rams might looking at those, uh, but but understood. Soon. Uh, okay, segueing from Chuck to Chuck. Uh, I'm not. Let's go with a fresh new year, fresh new attitudes. Uh, you have a rather fixed version of Grub Beehive, which looks for, be it what, all those compressed kernels and goodies, and saves a bunch of trouble. Is that indeed maintained code, and does the world deserve a port of that? Uh, speaking of things which preempted this, so yeah, um, back in evidently 2020, uh, I ran into a case where I was trying to, or a a internal user was trying to move off of a different hypervisor platform, which won't be named, um, to use Beehive. They their images are were all grub based. Um, the existing grub to beehive uh, using it is a giant pain in the ass and just not sustainable, supportable, any of that. So I took a crack at adding beehive as a uh, full platform uh, for Kimu, or I, not Kimu for grub um, and had gotten that working to the point where it works just like UEFI or um, uh, or that uh, uh, beehive loader in that you can just point uh, the grub at your disk image and it does all of the things that, that grub normally does, meaning it understands the different file systems. It knows how to find the grub folder and then load the appropriate kernel. And this is important because if you ever do a OS update of your, your VM, the name of the VM Linux in image changes. And um, with the grub to beehive, you need, that means you need to also then modify your um, your kind of grub config that lives outside of everything. So um, go ahead. I have two questions. Would your existing images work with uh, any of the uh, existing Beehive uh, boot rooms, either the EFI or the uh, CSM? 
Uh, I have not tried it with the uh, EFI one. I believe this would have worked with the CSM or, or probably, so, or, 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 well, actually, you know what? I, I have not tried it with UEFI at all. If it uh, does work, your work is already done because uh, then you don't need uh, any uh, external preloader. Yes. So, so um, this was work that I did in 2020. Um, I, mm -hmm. I have, I'm in the process of recreating the magic of what the heck I did to make this work and build again so that I can actually get something built again because, um, well, uh, so going back to the story, uh, this never got, the, the intent was to upstream it so that, that we could have nice things. But um, at the time there was no interest in uh, in using Grub, everyone says, ah, just use UEFI, it's all fine. No one's ever going to use uh, legacy BIOS stuff ever again. Uh, smash um, cut to... Oh, let him finish. Smash, smash cut to this week. Um, I had a different set of users wanting to move to Beehive and have run into the same issue. So um, I've decided that uh, I, I, I don't care what the community at large thinks. I, I, need, I need to make this happen. So, what prevents the use of UEFI in this situation? Uh, they have existing images that run on a different hypervisor. Yeah. And getting them to uh, transmogrify it to UEFI is a bridge too far. I, oh, so their legacy layout, you're saying? It's 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 a legacy layout. Okay. Um, the magic has, uh, on how to create those has been lost. So. Yeah it must use you you uh, uh uh grub okay that said is grub shipping with all the free bsd and net bsd and open bsd loaders whatever state they're in such that you could get super creative and load other os's with this code um it includes all of the loader bits okay. uh i i i honest I my main focus was um, getting Linux. Yeah. Uh, oh, kernels. no question. I'm just curious if because um, Grub but, does but, Grub does many things. I'll just say that Grub yeah, absolutely true. Um, may, may I ask a question? Um, absolutely. I'm not uh, leading you uh, off the topic too far. If, if it's if it's taking too far, then just say okay. You'll answer that uh, off of meeting or some other time or give me a pointer where I can read up. Um, what role precisely does, does Grub play in, in the Beehive booting process? Why why don't we emulate a legacy BIOS and then just read whatever is in the MBR of the disk and fire that up in real mode? Um, we can do that. The problem is that uh, nobody wants to maintain the um, BIOS compatibility mode in the uh, EDK2 CSM stuff. So basically this code is rotting uh, away. It exists, it used to work. As far as I know, it works right now. Does but it? That's good to know, because I got it at least if you have years ago. the old file around. I don't know <laughs> if a package is still shipped, good but I do know. have a server where I do have the, the old version of the boot ROM, and it still works with a new you um okay so um, instead of reading but that's basically running abandoned where if you don't if you have to run something compiled with gcc 4.8 uh and so on okay so instead of i don't know let me just work. check if it's available on the uh, on the freebsd package mirrors right now so chuck do you want to be a uefi developer or a grub developer at this rate it's like but yeah, pick I have your poison just you had a crazy idea, maybe. Yeah. Oh, Grub please. is almost an operating system lacking a bootloader, more than it is a bootloader. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so would it be possible to have a little few megabyte in size read-only block device holding only a Grub UEFI configured to chain load into the uh, existing configuration so that instead of going the normal way with UEFI um, directly to the boot disk. You go, go through the 
boot device, which then will take the grub configuration from the, uh, or load the grub from the other one, if that's possible. So, um, would 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 I need to because because I guess the the requirement that I'm getting is um, to basically boot unmodified disk images. That's why I came up with the idea because if basically you use another compatible grub to set up to read in the grub disk uh, from another disk, basically only tell grub, yeah, this is your little initial configuration, now read the rest of the configuration from the other disk. Hmm. If you can do that, because I'm not familiar with how exactly you would script that, but I do know that grub has a bunch of scripting functionality and it's normally only extended and the basics haven't changed really. So it may be that you can just use a modern grub version from ports not the beehive specific one, just grab, um, uh, or even just a minimal Linux system uh, you treat as overhead and then just take a just small Linux distribution, which by default uses grab and hack and slay at the uh, grab configuration until it just chain loads the other operating system, make it read only, document the creation process, and then you can run that and directly basically you, your boot path is then boot from read only device main disk and then so nothing changes other than where the grub code lives if that's possible yeah uh that's an interesting thought because let me would, let me think about that be just an attempt to script it together uh, and wouldn't require going into the depth of this uh, unpleasant code base. Gotcha. Rodney, you've been mighty quiet and you've been messing with bootloaders a whole lot this last few weeks. Do you have any observations or insights or concerns? Yeah, I put it in chat. At, at one point, somebody was working on getting the CBIOS working, which basically obfuscates the need for UEFI CSM to work. It's just, well, if we're going to do legacy, let's run a legacy BIOS. Right, it's right, right. Just right, fine right. inside a BI. And somebody had done a bunch of work um, to the point, I think they had even had VG, a VGA BIOS running in Beehive with um, uh, with the C BIOS image, so that you had a, a console's output, frame buffer output. Hmm. But I don't remember what happened on that work. I think it was Yakub at IX Systems with things like Corral, and that all just went kind of differently, weirdly that, sideways. That was, you name it. That, that would be another way to solve the problem of needing to run grub legacy stuff is you just run actually run the Linux grub in CBIOS. Yeah, exactly. The other problem is that uh, an external bootloader which doesn't use the VMM but runs basically a port of, for example, grub on the host as a privileged process um, is a giant attack vector. Normally, if you use grub uh, via grub beehive as documented, it's code as execution uh, as a service. So it's just that the default configuration is nice enough not to uh, exploit all the bu existing bugs in the file system drivers, which trust the on the structures to get code execution and run something malicious. Also being GPL'd, as I recall, it was like, well, where do we put it? Do we have like a separate package that's a module to Beehive or something crazy? I'm no, no. rely on others there. What is the idea was never to merge <clears throat> prop Beehive into Beehive. Okay. Correct. It was always its own port. Well, and CBIOS. That that's create... Sorry, to, back to CBIOS. Oh, what? Uh, I don't know what the uh, license model. C, C, C BIOS would be handled the same way that we handle ED2K or any of that yeah, stuff. It, it can just be a port. It's just a firmware module that yeah. be, you tell BI to load. I mean, it uses the exact same mechanism that we load UEFI with. Yep. 
It's and funny. There's a free BSD port of CBIOS. So I'm curious, like, uh, yeah, that's, what does that's that mean to us about. and for us? Yeah, like, okay, I, I hadn't checked in a long time. It was updated last March or so. LGPL. Yeah. Um, hmm. But that's not a problem at, at this stage. Because... Oh, from Roger from Zen. Go ahead. <laughs> The, the reason why it's not a problem is because it doesn't become part of your repository or your yeah. running system. It goes away once you boot. Mm -hmm. Or it, basically, you don't consider your server license compromised because there is some proprietary boot code in there, do you? It doesn't prevent you from no. legally running GPL kernels on top of that. So... Not so how would the how would the CBIOS uh, portion of this work? I mean, is there is there some it tie in be, to Beehive that we need? No, or it would become the boot ROM. You basically have to teach. You have to do basically On... a port to this the virtual main board. So um, to the hardware configuration you want to support, just like you normally have to support the chipset and so on yeah. in CBIOS. So you add things like setting up the APIC and the quirks where this board is slightly different than the other one. You compile it uh, into a ROM file and then you, you run it. Ah, okay. Okay. So then so okay, so then the work would be teaching the CBIOS port to output something that exactly um, teaching it to food. find the frame buffer, reading from the keyboard, reading from okay. virtual disks. Okay. I think all of that stuff's already done and resolved. Yes, you you have to someone has to put it together and just I don't know how much work it is. It could be that for someone familiar with the C bias it's so already put have... together. You're looking at the port on the screen. Right, for Zen. So it has dependencies on Zen because of uh, course that's what uh Roger's doing. And but he's no, a wonderful somebody, person and he may be else... able to advise us. <laughs> Somebody else had this CBIOS working inside of the. I'm office. looking. It was, I think, Jakub Kalama. I'm looking. Yeah, I'm I looking. think you're right. It was somebody at IX System because they wanted to use it for legacy stuff. <clears throat> yep. And anyway, he, he, even to the point that the VGA buffer was working. One of the, one of the, even I got to think. Do we em, do we emulate the 8042 um, uh, NVRAM for for setting storage? I think that was one of the missing pieces. Um, we do have support for durable EFI variables That's by splitting different. the ROM file into two parts. I don't know what, I think it's just a memory range which triggers a VM exit and then gets written back. So I don't even, if I remember correctly, you just have to use normal memory accesses to this range and then it triggers a VM exit and the data is copy to a file. So it's the, really about as simple as you can get, I think. Uh, Rod, do you Doesn't remember it, any specific flash chip? Sorry, I didn't I didn't mean to step on you. Go for it. Uh, Rod, do you remember if um, using CBIOS would preclude booting from uh, the VertIO PCI devices or NVMe or that sort of thing? Yeah, that probably would be an issue. Yeah, you're not going to have your C BIOS is not going to have drivers for anything but like IDE hard drives, yeah, um, and that kind of stuff. So you're not going to be able to point to a to a, a VertIO block device. Really? Maybe not VertIO, oh. but wouldn't it just because it supports modern hardware more or less uh, support NVMe? But again, CBIOS knows nothing about NVMe. Still not? Yeah, I doubt it. I don't see. There, you got to remember, CBIOS is for legacy support. So NVMe is not legacy equipment. No, some people are still using CBIOS to build uh, truly f uh, open hardware systems. Okay, well. Oh. Under the core boot label. I would seriously doubt that kind of maintenance work is being done to CBIOS. Because that's like, I mean... Even a Dell R seven twenty doesn't ship with NVMe support in it. You know, that's, and that's a fairly that's a lot newer BIOS than what CBIOS is based around. So, 
Um, now, there open, is a, open in the core. source code for uh, of the core boot CBIOS um, repository, there is a function called NVMe setup. I don't know if it's functional. Let's check okay. the releases. Yeah, now because the open core is using it, that may work. It may be the open core people may have enhanced. Looks like they did it in 2021. Hmm. The, I see a notice in NVMe improvement, so it should have worked even before. Um, well, there would be another thing get core boot working in Beehive. We have is about as simple a target to port to as you can wish yeah. for because you don't have to deal with real hardware. Chuck, it's going to be a long weekend for you. I can send caffeine products if you like. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I don't know if you want to do more homework on this. And Patrick, have you used Refined under Beehive? I did a quick smoke test of like Refined and Open Core, and I got surprisingly far. I just didn't aim it at VMs. I just got the loader to go under under um, UEFI. Sorry, I just was uh, away for a oh. second. Um, you mentioned no, no Refined. I, 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 I got that question. Yeah, yeah, um, cool. I, I frequently use Refined on real hardware. I have not yet tried it in Beehive. Okay. Uh, um, I just, just suggested this because is it open source or just closed source freeware? I'm not quite sure, but it, it absolutely painlessly boots on any system that uses UEFI and chain loads everything that's on any disk. I'm, I'm triple booting a small netbook with Windows on eMMC and FreeBSD and Haiku OS installed on an on a SATA SSD and yep, the plane works. So that's why I suggested it. We've all been somewhat on autopilot and using whatever worked and then we didn't explore new territory. So I'm being somewhat facetious, Chuck, but not entirely of like, hey, it, it it's worth a quick little hackathon just to see where we're at with each of these. Yeah. And I'm I'm in favor of you know a thousand flowers blooming because there might be use cases that strictly require uh, grub. Have a nice day. Too bad. Deal with it. And and that's where those additional features of grub might be interesting. In so far as you can only do things there that can't be done elsewhere, and naysayers can go and say nay. So uh, Chuck, has this been helpful to kind of map this out? And Immensely. If, thank thank you everyone. Our pleasure. And if someone is good with be it uh, core boot, open core, refined, refit, and all, and friends, feel free to just take a moment to just see how far you can get with uh, the native OS on the native OS and maybe a few others. So, uh, John D., welcome. Well, we've got Andrenik rolling in. We've got all kinds of folks rolling in. We've been talking uh, bootloaders this last while. I don't know what, what how much you caught, but we talked CBIOS. We talked a bunch of things. Um, D, if I can type. So anyway, uh, anything else on loaders? I'll even spare you a loader pun. And there's some links here. Package info on CBIOS. Yep, thank you. I think, Jan. Okay, yeah. moving on. Yeah, the CBIOS, just FYI, the CBIOS stuff, the, at least the source tree has files called like vertio pci and nvme.c so um that's feeling like a really good suggestion thank you yeah well yeah evidently because core i didn't re remember that core boot had picked up cbios and that's probably a big driving effort to enhance cbios yes because and certain vendors don't want to wait for uh, bios images to get new chips into the um locations. And Chuck, your fellow BeehiveCon presenter, Roger, is very much within reach and very nice to work with. So he can probably answer questions because he's stitching it into Zen for FreeBSD. Okay? Sweet. Thanks. Okay, Chuck, wow, well, you've monopolized this on Saber Store uh, and BIOS, and it's been awesome. So let's move on to a few things. Antrenig, I hope you have enough internet to get through the next few minutes. My machine is beach balling. Uh, small FYI, Antrenig, I got VNC passwords to work, but from the last call, uh, 
that doesn't necessarily mean uh, ba, 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 that we have an easy path to VNC encryption. Um, there was a conversation on the Fediverse. Wow, I can't even scroll. This is good. Um, about uh, like open BSD images under OmniOS. I didn't find a link for that in a quick search, but I can try. Uh, and Chuck, you mentioned cross VM. Can you describe what the Chrome OS virtual machine monitor is? Because I had not heard of that. Back to Chuck. Yeah, cross cross VM is a hypervisor kind of similar to Beehive in in the sense that it um, the cross VM part of it uh, emulates the user space devices and and basically does things like uh, Pope KVM. Um, it's used in Chrome OS to, I think, run uh, arbitrary Linux commands or arbitrary Linux things or OSs. Um, so it's it's the hypervisor that they're using internally. Interesting. Um, it, uh, it it's written in Rust, which is fun. Um, the the thing that's perhaps nicer about it is that it actually is cross-platform. So, for example, I built it on my uh, Windows laptop and was able to point it at uh, the Windows hy uh, kernel hypervisor, and and it just worked. So, in in terms of a hypervisor that seems to have gotten the um, back end. Um, abstraction right, uh, it, it it seems like an interesting one. This is also the, the code base that the um, Fire, wait, uh, Firecracker? Is that the, the AWS That's one? That's AWS no. fast yeah. quickie thingy, yeah. I, I think they started from CrossVM. Uh, oh, huh. My understanding is that they the, the, the two diverge fairly significantly now, but, but this is where they started. You use the word better in there. Can you be more specific? Better than all the things, or better than what? Um, uh, I have yet to run across a hypervisor that um, has done a truly. Good, most of the hypervisors are very tied to their back end. I mean, I guess Kimu to a degree um, allows that, but. Uh, uh, this they, they, uh, the cross VM folks seem to have done a nice job on that. Okay. Uh, what license is it under? Maybe Mozilla. I forget. FreeBSD, according to the GitHub repository. Really. Okay. Uh, and the other thing I just looked up at the documentation is that. Yes, it's Rust, but they do have apparently uh, the hypervisor side of VidIO VSOC in a compatible license you can look at without poisoning yourself. Hmm. So that you could take a look at, yeah, this code, this way to architect it go, uh, passes the Rust barrel checker. Unless they did too much macro and uh, there. Um, it could be interesting because if it's used in production with Linux as a guest, it should be compatible with the Linux VSOC stuff, which would also be nice to have for Beehive. Um, it's also possible to uh, have it boot UEFI, which means then you can boot arbitrary images. Oh, so it's not Linux only. Well, yeah, they the mostly guest. use it as Linux only, but there are a handful of patches such that you can actually get uh, UEFI to, to, to boot, um, uh, which which I've tried, and, and UEFI yeah. is a pain to build, but um, Yeah, but it, it works. may be then better to use KXEC if that moves ahead in FreeBSD. Mm. For running FreeBSD under that, but that's such a nice use case probably to run. So do we have Should competition the, um, here, the or what? Is that going to show up in ports? <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah, the idea wasn't to uh, port it to to FreeBSD or any of the other BSDs, I think. Hmm. Well, doesn't NetBSD need well, like a fourth you hypervisor? You could, you it it could be ported to FreeBSD, and and I think that the the fact that they had 
that um, the back end abstracted fairly nicely to me suggested that somebody could do that. And then at that point you could uh, put it in ports and, and then we could have three hypervisors that ran on FreeBSD, but. Cool. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. I had not heard of it. I appreciate that. And to give a loving nod to Illumos, I tried the new Illumos raw images under FreeBSD Hive and Surprisingly, they wouldn't boot, but maybe the latest ones do. I want to revisit that, and I'm trying to find that conversation about open BSD under Illumos Beehive not having uh, the smoothest experience, but I'm not finding it right off the bat. Jan, maybe you saw that on the Fediverse. Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, Probably not. Um... I'm dancing between two computers here. Mine is just frozen, but I've got a second one with the dock. Uh Antrenig, you were quite excited about veil switches. Jason Tubner thought, oh, they're they're fatal. So uh, what have you learned in the last few weeks? So um, <clears throat> if you use them with Beehive, they are fast. I was able to achieve um, a 10 gig connectivity with a veil switch. I'm sure it also can go more with some optimization. But then I thought, hey, my main use case is jails. And by the way, if I, if you, can, you can hear me, right? Because Yes, sir. You sound here. great. Okay, good. And actually, this is yet another Chuck topic insofar as he has a need for a faster interconnect. So let's explore this one yes. that's been kind of under-documented um, for sure. Yes, I was very much envious yesterday of uh, Illumos because I deployed OmniOS in our hackerspace and without any optimization, a zone to zone connection was 22 gigabit per second, apparently. So okay. I was like, okay, um, so I got into Veil. So here's the interesting part that there is a way to set up Veil with e pairs. The problem is that as soon as I do, the interface comes up, then I get a system crash. Uh, the system crashes and then it reboots. Uh, I've configured a uh, core dump facility uh, today, so I will be doing the same dump again and uh, start debugging into what the issue is. Um, because I do remember using it on FreeBSD 10 with e pairs, and I didn't have issues back then. So maybe the code has been diverged somehow. Uh, but the setup with ePairs is pretty simple. There is um, documentation in the forums, and uh, the man page is good, but there's no examples. Maybe it would be a good idea to add examples for Veil CTL as well. If yeah, I that, remember that correctly, yeah. yes, no. you don't even have to use ePairs. True. Be because the bridge uh, with Veil isn't a network interface in the sense that it shows up in IF config as a network interface. Uh, only the member ports may show up. Yes. And I think you can have a netmap pipe, which is also a veil port member, and that is then the interface. Uh, my, my problem was that if I try to create a veil port, the veil port cannot have an IP address. So I'm like, what should I do? Like move this veil port in, into a VNet jail and then the uh, same IP that, that didn't work. So I was kind of stuck in there. Yeah. I think what you have to go, right? It's not the, the veil port, it's the connection. Uh, what you need, uh, oh, I think it's called a netmap pipe. But it's a long time since I read that paper. <laughs> and Antony, uh, you yeah. mentioned wrapping one in the other. But yes, so they have this uh, dash. Uh, so yeah, you can you can you can do veil CTL. You could you create a veil switch using veil CTL, and then you can wrap a e pair inside. You can wrap an e pair inside a veil port, and then attach the port to the veil switch. That's one way. The other way that Jan was talking about is just connecting veil ports to a veil switch without any wrapping, but then uh, passing the veil port somehow to the 
VNet jail and assigning an IP address. So that I could not do. I have no idea how to do that. I, I can understand how to do it with, with, with Beehive, and there are options in Beehive to make that work very easily. Um, but I still couldn't assign an IP to it. Um, it yeah, so I was kind of stuck there. And again, if anyone find, f f can find any documentation, that would be very helpful for, for, e for VNet jails. But yes, I am very like impressed. I haven't tried Illumos for a while, and um, we we deployed it yesterday in our hackerspace, and we were very happy with the uh, OmniOS installation and and the way that zones work and like getting you know ten plus gigabit connection uh, without any optimization. That that was very very fast indeed. Um, yeah. Out of the box. Yeah. Out of the box. Yes um tomorrow's a friday it would be evening in europe do we does anyone present want to have a quick oh bootloader and networking hackathon because <laughs> ah. we definitely need to exercise these things and figure out where the heck we stand on them because it's like we have all these rumors of things working once and yeah let's just try to pin some of this down Anyway, other topics on high performance networking. You've got cross VM in the, 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 the min jail. Okay, I'll take a look at that. Uh, so this is John. Um, hello, John. How are you? I'm gonna I'm gonna nose nose in here for just a Please second do. on what was just being said about Vale. Um, I think you know that I I spent some time with Vale last year Remind and us. Um, trying to get it to work. Uh, moving it into some of our stuff that we do production and it ended up not going in and the conversation you, you we're there have been a couple of conversations go, going around that talk about uh freebsd and or beehive in the enterprise and what ended up happening was um the comment at the end there was you know if there's any documentation that you have can you please show it to me where it is so that i can read it and figure out how to make stuff work and that was basically the, one of the main reasons why we didn't go production with it is a dearth of documentation um, and understanding in general about how it works. So it was seen as too expensive. And if there were any technical issues with it, the resolution time is, is seen as too high a risk. Um, that is not me saying that Vale is not any good uh, by a long shot. I, I'm simply saying this because of the prior conversations where we talk about BSD and Beehive in the enterprise, and when management looks at something, that was that was the, ended up being the decision that was that was made um, due to the, the the risk being too high given the current understanding of the technology and the level of documentation. Yep, and read the I'm not, paper I'm not, is not the best yeah. thing to yell at management. And, and and I am not, yeah, and I am not here pointing fingers and saying it's it's not any good. Didn't say uh, you are. That, that's no. I'm simply saying that that is the that's the way upper management looks at the at the topic. I can go out there and find all kinds of information about uh, bridging, old style, you know, bridging. I can find all kinds of information about VertIO and optimizing and performance tuning but veil is thin it's that, a rocket ship with no seat belts that that's that's one way of looking at it it's a rocket ship that doesn't have any heat tiles on it also the fact, that I followed, uh, the fact that i followed the documentation from 2019 from some random blog or from the forum and uh, the result of that was the system just crashing is not very you know reliable let's put it in the good good thing it was the hacker space not on production you know so understood so okay. does anyone want to have a quick little show and tell hackathon in 23 hours on things like veil just to see quick show our notes together I'd be perfectly happy to watch. <laughs> Figure out where the hell we are because it, it's it's self defeating to have the infrastructure and not have it documented. Not helpful because we're like, oh, let's make another, let's make a fourth new network contraption to to solve this problem and kind of not understand the ones we have. So, uh, I will leave that to the reader. So, um, 
I may just announce the damn thing and say, hey, I'll be here and I'll try to search the hell out of it and make sense of it. Anyway, go ahead, Jan. So I looked at the code um, of the Beehive uh, Veil backend. Yes. Yes. And the problem there is that NetMap may offer potentially uh, the performance you wish for, but the Beehive network backend will not because it still processes it with thing in small batches at most and it's basically we would take a VM exit into the Beehive process and then it does the mem copy between one ring buffer and the other in user space. So you still take the context switches. You do, wouldn't have to if you had a better implementation, but right now that's where we are. Um, there is a single queue implemented on the um, vidIO device. So until we get and basically any backend which can have multiple yeah. queues would profit from just implementing that. I am in agreement with that statement. So what we really need is real-world support for, let's say, in the range of four to eight rings per direction per vidIO NIC. And maybe a bit uh, TSO, LRO implementation as well, so that and that would get us the uh, batching advantage indirectly because we were, wouldn't be moving, at least for bulk TCP traffic. Uh, I bought some LRO patches for VertIO recently, or at least the partial patches just recently got pushed for testing purposes, at least. Uh, so, internal to your organization or in the project? Uh, to the FreeBSD repo. Uh, I thought I saw those go by a, a little while ago. Yeah, if like, anyone has a link, we'll bring it up. Uh, I'll make just a simple note here. I saw some recent patches. Um, I'm looking. Cool. So what hardware were you measuring on Antrenec? The, so the hardware, yeah, the hardware that I was running on. Uh, give me a sec just to show you or just ballpark um, numbers yeah 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 no I, I can give exact numbers it was on srv zero hackerspace am yes um yes and we're talking cctl hardware is it model yes uh, 11 gen for i9 at 2.5 gigahertz wait are we talking omni os or the veil thing uh the omni os Oh, the Omni OS. Yes, the Omni OS was in a VM, if you can believe it. Wait, what? It was just, okay. yes. Uh, it was inside the Beehive VM with 16 gigs of memory and four CPUs, and I was able to achieve 22 gigabits per second on Hyper. Yeah. Um, and I'm absolutely loving the new Z Adam utility. It's very uh, neat. Uh, so that, that that's also very nice. But, but I can yeah. see that there's so a So my uh, little home server um, without any tuning yeah. EPR is about 1,020 or so megabytes a second. Sorry, how much? Uh, wait. M no, that's unrealistic. No, it's it stabilizes around uh, 870 megabytes a second. Okay. Okay. So I was I was yeah. able to get like. Let me around... check the. Of course, I could now cheat a bit I'm... and uh, raise the MTU. Or well, is it cheating or not? If you're doing it between local systems, you would get basically a linear performance increase almost with the MTU uh, uh, on ePair because the problem is that again ePair is one uh, thread per endpoint and direction so Remember. that's a yes we should have a little hackathon tomorrow or not <laughs> um, i'm happy I, to I, participate i'd like post. the idea of that yes okay because even if we just collect documentations or dump it in the wiki anything 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 i swear okay so 
Uh, okay, if you found those patches, great. If not, that's okay. Uh, we've covered a lot of. I just sent. I just sent a, uh, a link, and it's for. It, it definitely says it was for testing, but it was add LRO support for tap devices. Uh, there's a link to the um, review page as well in the commit. So let me drop that. Sure. Awesome. Uh, boom. But LRO is only one direction. Yep. So we don't need TSO, and then that's that you can't use LRO and TSO if you want to route. Mm -hmm. You can only use it basically on endpoints. Uh, what would help us uh, also would be to add. Uh, Basically, we, we already have in libc uh, functions to send and receive multiple packets on a socket. Uh, right now, it's not it's only there for compatibility with software which uh, expects uh, these functions. They're implemented as just a do a pol loop and send the package packets as is. But if this system call ever got really implemented, and was supported on the um, top and file descriptors, it would get us the uh, ability to send batches of hundreds of packets per system call or receive as many while maintaining the uh, packet boundaries. Since it's a device, you could argue that it would be better to maybe use the AIO uh, list submit command as well or something like that but i think the list is a bit short there but yeah no 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 that was a fix it i don't know uh, uh this no, is a blog post what's going on? Can... Uh, just a... it's basically the question is how do you encode an array of uh, an array of buffers uh, and movement hmm. between user space and kernel space. Yeah. So, and it's a system call which already exists. Uh, I don't know if you can implement it on uh, directly on a device. I think you can only use ARO on normal files and um, sockets, and even though only for certain file systems. Uh, what do we know about packet drill, Rodney? And I do not recognize this name, which is great news because that means it's a new or revitalized contributor. So, okay. Tuxen? Tuxen? Uh, What's the Tucson, name? Uh, Tuesday, Tuesday Zen. I guess I don't know. Tucson, Michael Tucson. He's been around for a while. He's one of the the transport guys. Him, Richard Schaffernegger, um, Tom Jones, Randall yeah. Stewart, Glab, and stuff that work on the TCP stack, transport stack. I'm pretty involved with him at. They're, they're mostly Netflix guys, but I'm, I know them from IETF. I deal Got with them all in IETF. He's a, yeah. That is good to hear. Okay. Uh, so it sounds like that might be one part of the bigger picture and we need the other direction covered. But I'm glad to see that work happening. I'll just leave this IPIXIE thing here. So we have covered a lot of ground. We have not heard a whole lot from some people. Daniel, you were able to roll in mid-meeting. Do you have anything to share? Uh, no, nothing nothing over here. What he meant uh, is take a moment to listen to, the, to yesterday's open ZFS call with an amazing presentation on his Delta tool, but that's uh, orthogonal to Beehive itself. Was that accurate? Yeah, although if we can get uh, sort of that async, uh, super easy async clustering, you know, async clustering for uh, for your grandma, if I can get that going, then I can present it to on the Beehive call. 
Cool. Perfect. Yes. Sorry. No, no. I, I didn't mean to imply that it would work. With, it's just that you would have to implement with a way to, to, to move multiple packets per system call, perfect even in both directions. So basically a bidirectional exchange buffers. Hmm. Uh, so that because even with send and receive multiple packets, which uh, there is a system um, man page for of, of this uh, function. Let's see, send MMSG. Mm -hmm. While it's documented uh, in the category two, because it goes with uh, the normal send message uh, system call, the send multiple messages and the receive equivalent is in reality a libc function which uh, implements this feature with call on the socket and just does them one system call at a time. So it can be even slower than just doing it using your normal KQ based event loop because then now you're using poll with a single socket so that it can work with um, non-blocking sockets. Yeah. Okay, we are at one beautiful sweet hour, shall we call it there? And if I have like more than two people say, hey, let's do some kind of little organizational documentation hackathon tomorrow about advanced dish networking, I'm happy to schedule that. If you Show schedule if you schedule something, I'll try to show up. Okay. Uh, Send me you a message. It, they will come. <laughs> okay. You got it. I'm calling it at 11.59. Thank you, everyone. I will be around a few minutes. As far as doing something like that goes, how are we planning on meeting? I know oh, the last yeah, little hackathon-y huh? thing we did in... Uh, Discord. Uh, Discord. That was interesting, and the feedback was uh, huge. Uh, let me just... Uh, let me, okay, I'll officially call the meeting, but let's record for a few minutes here. YouTube.com slash at call for testing. So this is funny. It's like, yeah, let's see. History, your channel. Oh, I'm logged in. Videos. So that said, uh, 120 views compared to the usual low double digits, sometimes high double digits. Uh, that was really popular. <laughs> People like that. I'm surprised they... Um. Enjoy that. Go okay, ahead. Yeah. Then. I just noticed that the Linux ABI kernel module implements the system call. So uh, which this, multiple this messages. system call? Yeah, so we have a, the functionality exists in the Linux KBI module. Oh, the uh, compat one? Yes. yes. Okay. At least in 14 is zero, so I'm not yeah. looking at current right now. That's but, cool. That's cool. Um, but otherwise, it's this trivial little uh, wrapper around send MSG, and then, yeah. Which uh, doesn't get you any performance advantages about, compared to doing it yourself. Okay. But let's have a look how it, the implementation for Linux works. Maybe it's as easy as moving it out of the kernel module and uh, the implementer just didn't think about adding it natively and getting the next system call number for it. If okay. It's, it could be as stupid as that, that someone implemented a useful functionality and didn't find it useful. Uh, will you investigate that? A little. Cool. Okay. I'm curious, but... Uh, these things aren't always as easy. Yep. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Calling it. Have a great one. Perhaps see you tomorrow. I'll send an announcement. I'll consult with others on what platform we use. Have a great one. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Michael.